Bible reading. But before we read, shall we just have a moment of prayer? Father, we are asking that you will open our eyes of understanding as we read your word today. We are asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. The book of the prophet Isaiah. The book of the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a winepress therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? And now go to. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned, digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. 
For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one both, and the seed of an homer shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the viol, the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with a cart rope that say, let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may know it. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them. And the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. Whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent, their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Chapter 6 In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten, as a teal tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. You have just listened to the Bible reading, and we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You have seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned in the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray.
Jesus friends who never turned your backs on you all that's the world around you wouldn't see you as a fool but I did sin like me you shall be Praise the Lord. If you are happy to be at the Bible study, I said praise the Lord. The Lord bless everyone as we study together tonight in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the blessed time we have in your presence. Thank you for the revelation of your word. Without your word, the world will be in darkness, in the darkness of spiritual emptiness. But you've given us your word so that you will show us the way to live here and the power to live here and the possession we ought to have so that our lives will flow in the direction of your word and your will and to please you in everything. We're asking tonight, as we look at this word, the redemptive truth you have preserved for us will be ours in Jesus' name. We pray nobody will be absent-minded, and we pray Lord will be awake to hear you, and we'll see what you have for us in your word in Jesus' name. Grant us the grace, grant us the strength, Grant us the enablement that we will be 
everything we ought to be for the glory of your name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another amen. amen. God bless you. You can sit down. As we continue in our study of the scriptures, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And today we're studying from verse 24 all through to verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Here the apostle had been talking about the Christian life and the grace we ought to have in our lives, the strength we ought to have as we walk along, walking by faith and living by faith in the path that leads to ultimate uh, destination, which is heaven. And then he compares our Christian life with the race that the athletes run. And he says, as we run, we run to receive a prize. We run to receive the crown. And he's asking, as he asks them, he's asking us as well. He says, don't you know that they which run in a race, all of them run so that they can receive the prize. And then he says, you as a Christian, you as a child of God, you as a pilgrim on your way to heaven, so run in such a way that you will obtain the prize, obtain the crown. It tells us in verse 25, it says, and every man that striveth for the mastery, he wants to win in the race. He wants to get to the final destination and he wants to get there knowing that the Lord is waiting for him to receive the prize. Is he masters everything around him and is temperate, he's self-denying in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. He says, all those people that run in the world, all those athletes that run in the world, the things they receive, the prize they receive, the crown they receive, will soon fade away because it is temporary and because it is earthly and because it is corruptible. It says, but we and incorruptible that is the prize we're going to receive and the prize we're waiting for and the prize we're expecting at the end of the journey at the end of the race is an incorruptible crown it tells us in verse 26 and then it says i therefore so run he made himself an example to the corinthians an example to all the gentiles an example to all the believers he said I run, I run, I'm running, I'll keep on running until I see the Lord face to face, until the final reward is given. He says, therefore, I so run, not as uncertainly. He said, I am not doubtful, I'm not doubting anything about my race. At the beginning of the race, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ. I had the Lord Jesus Christ. He spoke to me. I know there is a destination. I know there is heaven. And also, I was taken to the third heaven, and I know that there is a place called heaven or paradise, the third heaven, and I know that I'm going to be there. And therefore, I so run, and I run with confidence. I run with certainty. So fight I, not as one beating the air, not as one wasting time and wasting life and wasting energy and wasting all my resources. I am fighting, certain fight, and I know I'm not beating the air. It says because of that, in verse 27, it says, but I keep my body under to have the mastery. I have to be temperate and to overcome triumphantly. I have to deny myself and make sure that nothing hinders me in the race I'm running. It says that's why I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. 
conviction lest by any means when I have preached to others I myself should be a cast away he was saying I'm watchful I'm prayerful I'm purposeful so that on the final day I will not hear depart from me ye workers of iniquity I know you not he said I don't want to be a cast away on the final day that is why I keep my body under puts everything under subjection while I'm running the race the topic tonight is running the race to obtain an incorruptible crown running the race the Christian race running the race the race the Lord had set before us running that race to obtain an incorruptible crown we're dividing the message to three parts number one running the race with persevering commitment as we run the race it's not enough to persevere just for one week or one month or one year all through our lives we're running the race we're persevering commitment point number two receiving the reward of a priceless crown that's the goal that's the purpose whatever we do now whatever we do any day whatever we do in the christian race if we don't get to the end if we don't get to the destination if we do not have eventually that priceless eternal crown then all would have been in vain that's the reason we want to see how to so on that we receive the reward of a priceless crown point number three is recognizing the reality of a possible cast away that the possibility is there that's why paul the apostle said that i keep under my body and i bring everything everything my body everything my thoughts everything my life everything all that surrounds me i keep everything under subjection under control so that at the end finally i will not be a cast away you'll not be a cast away in jesus name point number one now is running the race with persevering commitment have you seen any athlete how they jog how they exercise how they do everything not only at the for the olympic or for the time they're going to contest but every time every day of their lives they're preparing themselves and they're doing everything that needs to be done so that when that day comes they'll not be disappointed and that's why as we ourselves were think about the christian life about the christian journey about the christian pilgrimage and about the race we're running every day and every time and every moment we do not allow any time to pass when we slack back and when we throw down our shoulders our hands as if we cannot do anything the commitment the consecration and the sin that you push yourself into it's there every time you are not forgetful you are a spiritual athlete you are not forgetful that you are running a race it might be your place of work it might be in the home it might be in the church it might be with your friends it might be with your neighbors you want to understand every time that your life is the life of running a race that your life is the life of fulfilling the will of god and day by day and step after step taking all the steps you ought to take so that on the final day you will have a well done i will have a well done say it aloud we're coming now to first corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24 it says know ye not that they which run in a race run all but that but one receiveth the prize it then says so run it's now saying not everybody in life is an athlete not everybody in life is a runner but now it says everyone in the kingdom 
everyone in the church every child of god the young and the old the boy the girl the man the woman everyone were to so on we are all at least spiritually so he says so on that ye may obtain that's your goal that's your purpose that's the reason you are a christian you are running the race in such a way that at the final day you will have the reward then he tells us in the first part of verse 25 he says in verse 25 and every man that has that that must have the mastery is temperate in all things everyone that is running that race everyone that is uh, wanting to have the reward of the final day he must so run that he will have the mastery if he's going to have the mastery then he must strive lawfully he must strive loyally he must strive scripturally he must strive according to the thing that the lord has laid down and then he is temperate in all things there is no part of his life that is flabby there's no part of his life that is careless. There's no part of his life that is fleshly. There's no part of his life that is out of control. Every man, every Christian, every believer, every child of God running in the race must so run that he has the mastery and that he is temperate in all things. That's what temperate means, self-controlled. That means uh, that you are under the control of the Spirit of God under the control of the scriptures under the control of the doctrines of the bible because you want to have the mastery as you're on in hebrews chapter 12 reading from verse 1 hebrews chapter 12 reading from verse 1 is still talking about running the race and is telling you telling me telling everyone what we have to do how we ought to comport ourselves, how we ought to bring ourselves under control and the things we need to get rid of in our lives so that we can strive for mastery and be temperate in all things. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, it says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What does he mean by that? He's uh, giving us uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and then he's talking about Enoch and he says that is part of the example we're given. He's giving us the example of Abel and Abraham and Noah and Sarah and uh, Isaac and Jacob and then of uh, the parents of Moses and of Moses and of all the other prophets in the Old Testament and he says what shall I say more? Time will fail me to talk about this this and that and he's saying now he puts everything all together in a conclusion and it says they ran their race and you are now running your race it says we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses it says now let us lay aside every weight is telling us no athlete was strapped on a 20 pound belt and then he's running the race he wants to be as light as possible so that there is no weight that will weigh him down so that there is nothing that will impede his speed because he wants to win therefore every kind of weight and every kind of load he'll shed off he'll throw off he'll cast off so that he can run the race appropriately that's why he says we now as we're running the race let us lay aside every weight every weight whatever will weigh you down the things of the world the pressures of the world and the interaction in corporations of the world whatever will weigh you down that you will not be able to run at the speed you ought to run you'll not be able to run loyally you'll not be able to run scripturally you'll not be able to run according to the purpose and the plan and the calling of god for your life whatever will hinder you whatever will slow you down whatever will put any pressure on you that you will not be able to run appropriately lay that aside and the sin that so easily beset us the sin that will normally come and will hinder and will prevent and you'll not be able to run 
when there's guilt on the conscience, you cannot run well. And when there is a condemnation on your conscience, you cannot run well. When your conscience is knocking every time, saying you are backsliding, you have committed sin, you have yielded to that thing again, you've done that evil thing again, you are praying, it comes to mind, you are reading the Bible, it comes to mind, you want to do anything, all that comes to mind, it says, if we're going to run, and we're going to win the victory. If we're going to run, and we're going to have the well done of the Lord, every which we must lay aside. And the sin that does so easily beset us, we must lay aside and look at this and let us run with patience, that's perseverance. Let us run purposefully. Let us run intelligently. Let us run according to the dictates of the Spirit of God in our hearts. Let us run with patience, perseverance, the race that is set before us. You cannot set another race. You cannot raise up a different standard. It's the same standard of the Word of God and the doctrine that Christ has given us. And it says that is what to focus on. You see, there are people that will set another race, not the race that the Lord had set. They have a standard that is lower than the New Testament, and they have a standard that excuses their besetting sin. They have a standard that will justify whatever they do, and they think that the end justifies. That means it says, abandon the kind of race, because that one will not take you to heaven. The race that will take you to heaven is the race he himself had said, and let us run with patience, and let us run with perseverance, and let us run with the power of God in us, the race that is set before us. It tells us in First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 2. First Peter chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 2. It says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. What he's telling us here is the running of the race implies that we're walking and we're living and we're acting out the will of God not the lusts of men, not the desires of men. We're not living by the philosophies of men, by the principles of the world. We're not living by the practice of our neighbors. We're not living by the low standard of the sinners and backsliders in the world, but the will of God, which is holy, the will of God, which is high, the will of God, which is heavenly, we're walking by that will of God. He tells us in verse 3, in verse 3, he says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have, brought, to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. He said, when we were blind, when we were Christless, when we didn't have salvation in the past before we became converted and before we came to the cross, he said that time is enough. We've served the devil enough in the past. We've walked with the people of the world in the past. We've walked, we've walked in the principles, in the precepts, in the proverbs, in the practices of the corrupt world, and that's enough. He says now, when we walked in lasciviousness in the past, laws, excess of wine and revelings and banquetings and abominable idolatries. But now look at verse 4. In verse 4, he now says, wherein they think is strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. It says we're not running 
and were running the Christian race, and the Christian race were running is playing. The Christian race we are running is very clear. If you are a young person, the way you behave, the way you live your life, all the other young people around you, they are wondering, how could you live like this? How could you be doing that? Everything straight, everything honest, everything biblical, everything Christian. How can you do that? It says wherein they think is strange. They think conversion is strange. Transformation is strange. Holy life is strange. A pure life to them is strange. If you're working in an office where everybody tries to change this and turn this their own way and they want to practice fraud and they are calling you to be part of them. It looks strange when you say, no, I'm satisfied with what I have and the blessing of God will be on what I have. I don't have to be fraudulent. And then when you're a young man, you're a young woman and you're not giving your body to him morality and there's no fornication there's no adultery and you are just walking in your life a straight life a pure life and then they are surprised they say you are strange how can you be like this a young man like yourself a young lady like yourself and not have a boyfriend not have a girlfriend and not have a same partner wherein they think is strange that she run not with them to the same excess of riot you are not in the nightclubs and you are not in any violent uh, habit and you are not uh, watching their field cinema and you are not watching any of those pornographic things and they wonder well, how do you spend your life how do you live your life if you're not into this if you're not into that that is the life of a person that is running the race with persevering commitment they think it's strange that we run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you but praise the Lord, we'll keep on doing what we're doing because we're running a race and that race will take us to heaven in Jesus' name. It will take me to heaven. I said it will take me to heaven. Now, the apostle tells us some people that ran before and they lived before according to the word of God. But now something snapped and something changed. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 7. Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 7. Here Paul, the apostle, was telling them, you did run well. The time I knew you, when you were converted, when you were born again, when you started studying the scriptures, you did run well. The time I knew you, when everything turned around, and then you became new creatures in Christ, you did run well. The time I knew you, when the love of God fills your heart, and you walk according to the way of the Lord, and the restitutions you ought to make, you corrected everything, you cleansed your life, all the things you stole, you returned everything, and all the lies you told, you corrected everything. You say, I don't care what people think about me. I want to live the Christian life. I saw you at that time. I knew you at that time. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? The Galatians said, they, they slowed down, they turned back. They adjusted things, they tried to cut corners, and they were not very diplomatic, and they were not sincere anymore. And Paul the Apostle said, I'm surprised about you, that you are no more running, and you are no more walking, and you are no more as sincere as diligent and you're no more as temperate you're no more as self-control as you used to be you did run well who did hinder you that he should not obey the truth look at verse 8 in verse 8 it says this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you whosoever who, whoever it was that came to persuade you that holiness cannot be at the level of the bible whosoever came to persuade you you don't have to be righteous every time you don't have to be righteous in every detail and every part of your life and you don't have to make everything correct and everything standard and everything according to the foundation of the christian faith that the lord had given us he said whosoever persuaded you to turn around and not to live at the level of the consecration you had before he didn't do well this 
persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Look at verse 9. It says, A little leaven leafness the whole lump. A little leaven, a little adjustment, a little compromise, a little search, a little lie, a little deception, a little dishonesty a little hypocrisy uh, that's what the corinthians the galatians were not doing they were adding some little little things that will just make them to be more like the world and paul the apostle said that's not running the race if you're running the race all those little little termites that come in uh, and all those little foxes everything must go away from your life and then you must focus on the race the lord has called you to run a little leaven uh, Leafness, the whole lump. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 14. Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 14. It says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That's the race. That's the race. Everything you do, you are giving something to somebody. Do it cheerfully, do it happily. Do it joyfully and do it sincerely. Do it wholeheartedly. Do all things without memories and disputes in your spiritual life. You're reading the Bible. Do it cheerfully and do it like this. The great thing I have to do. Or you are praying. Do it without memory, without disputing. You are evangelizing. Do all things without memories and disputes. And you are obeying the scriptures, obeying the word of God. And you are serving the Lord with sincerity of heart. Do all things without memories and without disputes. In verse 15, it tells us that he may be blameless. That's the standard. That's the standard. Some people say, I know I have my own blemish. Why do you keep the blemish? I know I have my own fault. Why do you keep the fault? I, I know I have my own abortion and all that in my life. Why should you keep that? If you're going to run the race, all those things you push aside, all those things you set aside, and it says that he may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world and then he tells us in verse 16 it says holding forth the watch of life that's running that's running the race holding forth the word of life anything you do everything you do you have a clear scripture to back yourself up you say this is the word my light is going to shine this is the word i'm going to be the light of the world and the light of my community i'm going to be the salt of the earth and you live by the word every time there is a, so that it's not like somebody will open the bible to you and then you say well i'm sorry i didn't remember but that when I did that other thing then we open another one I'm sorry I didn't remember that when I did that, that other thing it says the watch of God must guide our lives must guard our lives and in our behavior in our character in the way we live in everything we do we're showing forth and holding forth the word of life then it says that I we rejoice in the day of Christ. It says, Philippians, you are my converts. Philippians, you are the disciples I'm developing. And if you live according to the word and you run the race the way you ought to run in the day of Christ, I will rejoice that I have not run in vain. When you are preaching and the people you are preaching to are not converted, and you're not preaching about conversion, you're just teaching Bible, Bible knowledge that doesn't bring conversion. When you're, when you're a pastor, and you're pastoring people, and you're not discipling them, and you have the people, they're forgetting the good old days, and they're forgetting the ancient landmarks, and they're forgetting the standard of holiness by which we ought to live, but you don't care, you are just a pastor, and you're preaching, everybody is having a nice time, and they don't make heaven at last, 
then you have run in vain you have labored in vain it is better you come back to the word and the things you teach will bring conviction and it will bring conversion and it will bring consecration that the members the people who are hearing you will come back to the word and run the race with perseverance and commitment so paul the apostle said it is when you live by the word you are holding forth that word of life i will rejoice in the day of christ that i have not run in vain neither labored in vain how, how can we do that in our lives to have that such a power and such commitment that we will not be tired and every time and every day we're moving on and we're running the race appropriately look at galatians chapter 2 reading from verse 2 galatians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 2 it says and i went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which i preach among the gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation privately to them which are of uh, of reputation you know what paul the apostle is saying paul the apostle said i got the heavenly vision and then I got the vision and I've been running and I've been running, preaching the gospel everywhere. But then I said, wait a moment. I need to go to the people that, that received the commission originally and compare notes and tell them what I've been preaching and tell them what I've been doing and tell them what my manner of life is. I don't want to be in isolation. and I don't want to deceive myself and say, I know it all. Whatever they're doing at the headquarters of Jerusalem, and let them hold on to that. He said, I came to them by revelation and revealed to them what I've been doing lest by any means I shall run our drawn in vain. Do you ever do that? Do you allow a brother, a sister to discuss with you on what we have learned in the word of God? Or do you say, keep your ideas to yourself, I know myself. Do you allow your husband to pick you up and say, my wife look at what we heard and look at this look at this and then you frown and say what's the matter am i a backslider why are you telling me that if you're a real child of god you want to allow your wife to talk to you your husband to talk to you your neighbor to talk to you so that you will not run in vain on the final day and you want to allow your pastor to to talk to you and call you and say hi about this and hi about that how does that go how has that been going on you're not frowning and saying uh, well you've taught the bible study and you preach the message let it stop there don't bug me and don't follow after my life paul the apostle said i went to them who are of reputation who know more than i know so that i can listen to them i don't want it to be on the final day the lord will tell me you ran in vain or you are drawn in vain i pray you'll not run in vain i will not run in vain look at verse 20 in verse 20 it says i am crucified with christ that's the only way to live the righteous life and to live the holy life and that is the only way to perseveringly live with commitment itself is not crucified if that uh, a kind of a ego in the heart is not crucified if the nature of pride in the mind in the heart is not crucified you'll be running but you'll not run the race the way god expects and paul the apostle said i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but Christ liveth in me. When Christ lives in you, the life you would have lived if he was in the world today, every word of your mouth, every action of your hand, every thought of your heart, everywhere you go, everything you see, everything you contact, when Christ lives without any inhibition and without any hindrance, that's how to run the race. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, 
nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, not by unbelief. I live by the faith, not by doubting. I'm not sure of what I'm doing. I'll do it in any case. I don't know whether this is right or wrong. I'll do it in any case. That has not the life. The life that lives by faith, dynamic faith, the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we're going to run like that and run acceptably and run uh, before the Lord and God will say that is good, that's what I expect. How do we do that in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31? Isaiah chapter 40, we're looking at verse, uh, verse 31. It says in chapter 40 of Isaiah, and in verse 31, it's talking about the strength we have and the power we have, and it's talking about the stability we have to run and not be weary and then to walk and not faith and then we have to wait on the lord we have to take what we're hearing to god in prayer and we have to look at everything i've had this how does my life match with that how does my life go along with that and it is that as we wait upon the lord it strengthens us and then we're able to run with the energy and the power of the spirit isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 but they that wait upon the Lord that's praying watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation watch and pray that your life will be straightforward and your life will be glorifying unto God but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run they shall run, they shall run. They've been waiting upon the Lord, and the Lord has renewed their strength. They have been waiting upon the Lord, and the Lord has empowered them. And it says, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk, and they shall not faint. I pray that power to run, and that strength to run, and that spiritual energy, ability to run, to please the Lord, will be in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. We're running to receive the reward of a priceless crown. We're back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, is self-controlled in all things now. They do each obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. They in the world, they who are sinners, they who are only playing games that do not take them to heaven. It says they do all that to obtain a corruptible crown, a crown that will fade away, a crown that even while they're still in, in, in the world over here, they'll forget the joy of that day. It says it's just corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible.